What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekaWatt video and it's time for another RTX 3080 build guide. Today, with the best value combinations possible without sacrificing on performance. I'm going to run you through all the parts I selected and why, the build process of how to put this machine together before booting it up and testing it with over 10 of the most popular AAA titles. So hang tight, but let's jump into it. But first, a quick word from today's video sponsor. AlphaSync's custom gaming PCs are built by eBuyer.com's in-house experts. And what's more, they've got a range of RTX 3000 series systems featuring the new 3080 and 3090 cards available to buy. Head to the first link in the description below where all the parts are sourced from the most trustworthy and innovative manufacturers. And with free next day delivery, you can get your RTX 3000 game on now. Check them out at the the first link in the description below. Now, as always, I'm gonna build as many components onto our motherboard as possible before we go ahead and move it into the case. And specifically, this is the Asus ROG Strix B550F Gaming. Now, while you probably could go for a B450 board if you really wanted to save some cash, this is gonna be great, especially for the newly announced Ryzen CPUs. In the meantime though, I've got AMD's Ryzen 5 3600X. Whoa, James, you used this before and people were quite confused. They were like, is this not a huge bottleneck? Well, no, I'm gonna dive into this in more detail later with detailed performance benchmarks, comparing this combo with a load of others. So hang tight for that. Until then, installing our CPU is pretty easy. You want to pull back the arm on your CPU socket and then just drop the CPU into place, lining it up with this triangle on the corner of the motherboard socket. The CPU is going to drop into place and the arm falls down just like so. Next up, I'm going to install our RAM or our memory today. I've gone for a white and black theme overall, as you can see. So this 16 gigabyte kit from Corsair with RGB, of course, is a great bet. And it's not too expensive, which fits with the whole kind of value-oriented idea behind today's video. Installing it is pretty easy. Pull back the clips on the second and fourth dim slots and then align your notch on the RAM dim with the corresponding notch on the motherboard. Now, if you're really, really keen on saving another maybe $10, $15, then get a non-RGB kit, but these are gonna look really great today. Next up today then, it is teeny tiny little screwdriver time, which can only mean one thing, it's time to pop in our SSD or our storage today. Now, this is Seagate's Barracuda 510. It's an NVMe SSD drive and it's really quick speeds are actually pretty important for the new 3000 series GPUs from Nvidia, particularly the 3080 and 3090 cards. Plus one terabyte of capacity is gonna be pretty spot on for today's build. We just need to remove this top M.2 heatsink cover, and that's gonna expose the M.2 slot itself. There we go, lovely stuff. And the drive is just gonna very nicely slide into place. We need to secure it down with this equally tiny little screw. There we go. All that's really left to do then to our motherboard before we move it into the case is to install the CPU cooler and tidy the desk up today because we can't be working in a messy environment. That is just top of the list of things you don't do. Now then, I've gone the air-cooled route for today's build. Truth be told, this isn't gonna give us a load of overclocking headroom, but is gonna be pretty quiet and also, importantly, a great value option. Specifically, it is from Be Quiet, and it is their Pure Rock 2 cooler, the new kind of blacked out version. Now, installing this cooler is actually pretty simple. He says, <laughs> that was really tight. We need to remove the pre-installed stock mounting hardware, but we're actually... <laughs> So tight, but we're actually gonna keep the back plate and reuse that. We're then gonna take these four tall black spacers and actually pop these on each corner of our CPU socket. And then actually take these included brackets and pop these on top of them. Just a dab of thermal paste before we can actually go ahead and secure the CPU cooler down. Okay then, I'm gonna actually add the CPU cooler fan later to make the motherboard as easy as possible to pop on into our case. Talking of which, this 
is the new Dark Flash DLX21. It's got a kind of polygon mesh front that's great for airflow and aesthetics. It's got a magnetically held tempered glass side panel. Why don't more people just put these on doors? It is genuinely so much more simple. It's the same story around the back. It <laughs> It's just a doddle, this case. And also has this pretty weird GPU support bracket, which we're probably gonna take out later. But either way, it's a really nice case at a great price point. And like all the components today, I'll link it in the description below. That's kind of a bit of a weird contraption, but maybe for really heavy graphics cards, it's probably not a bad shout. Okay then, to install the motherboard into the case, you wanna grab this bag of accessories that you'll find located around the rear of the chassis. And we just need to check that there's a standoff installed in our case under each of the corresponding holes uh, on our motherboard. So you can see here we've got three at the top, three across the middle row and three along the bottom which in the case corresponds to these locations. We just need to whack an extra standoff in here, here and here. Whoa! Now, this case has also got a raised center standoff, which will just hold it in place while we screw each of the nine screws securely into place. With the motherboard now installed, that brings us nicely on to the power supply. And this is Corsair's new CX750F. It's pretty similar to the CX750M, which I recommend quite a lot really, but it's white, so fits the color scheme today, and has RGB. That looks so clean in white. It kind of matches my case and my hoodie and, you know, the office. <laughs> Very color coordinated today. Now then, when it comes to cables, we don't actually need too many. We just need a fat 24 pin motherboard cable, the biggest of the bunch, uh, a couple of SATA power harnesses, which are these kind of long, thin cables, as well as a dual six plus two pin PCIe power connector for the graphics card. And then finally a four plus four pin CPU power connector. And then it is a simple case of sliding the power supply in, preferably fan facing downwards if you can, and then securing it down through these four screw holes. Now the power supply is in, it makes sense to plug up as many cables as we can while everything is easy to access before we pop that graphics card in, which I'm really, really excited for. Now the motherboard connector is first, and this goes to the right hand side of the board. The four plus four pin CPU power connectors up next. That goes to the top left of the motherboard and plugs up just like so. While we're here, it also makes sense to do the front panel connectors, which are quite nicely cable managed actually. That's pretty impressive. All right then, all that really leaves us to do is install this, the graphics card. Now this is of course the Asus Tough Gaming RTX 3080. Now providing you can actually get your hands on one, this is one of the best value 3080s on the market. It's got the really good triple fan cooler to keep things nice and low in the temperature department and also provide a decent bit of overclocking headroom. Wow, that is like really, really heavy. There's loads of metal in the construction, a fully metal back plate. Those heat sinks are, are really, really big. And overall, the stance of the card feels really quite large. Now then, actually installing the graphics card is pretty easy. All we need to do is remove the second and third PCIe slots with these black screws, and then reuse the same screws to secure the GPU into place. We're then just gonna plug our graphics card up. And I am really digging these white cables before finally, and this is the last step, adding in a couple of optional dark flash RGB fans. With that being said though, that pretty much wraps it up for the actual build process today. All that's left to do is a little bit of cable management before booting this machine up to see how it looks, but more importantly, how it performs. Roll the montage. Your love. Okay then, now you've seen just how good this system looks when it's all powered up and of course the process of putting it together, let's see exactly how it performs in 10 of the most popular, the latest, the most intense AAA titles on the market. 
Kicking things off with GTA 5 as usual, starting, you know, not too difficult. Here we're at 4K high settings using the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. You look at an average of 92 frames per second, with a 90th and 99th percentile result of 88 and 78 respectively. These numbers fall in line with even the Core i5 combo that I tested that would have had a slightly higher single threaded clock speed and thus some slightly better performance figures. Next up is Apex Legends. Here at 4K medium to high settings with a balance of the two, V-Sync of course disabled, you're looking at 120 frames per second on average, with 101 and 87 FPS for the 90 and 99th percentile results. Next up then today is Call of Duty's Warzone. Here I tested the game at 1440p, so we can get some slightly higher, more competitive settings. 115 FPS on average made for a great gaming experience, with 101 and 93 FPS for the 90 and 99th percentile results respectively. Here you can see the 3600X is not really bottlenecking us too much at the lower 1440p resolution, where normally you may want a slightly faster CPU. Forza Horizon 4 is a similar story. At 4K with the Ultra preset and the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode, you look in 118 FPS on average, with 103 and 97 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. To give a bit of context, Forza Horizon 4 typically runs at 45 to 60 FPS on the current gen Xbox One X. So 118 FPS is pretty bonkers. Overwatch is once again a bit of an FPS party. Here you see an 197 FPS on average at 4K high settings with 169 and 143 for the 90th and 99th percentile results respectively. Visually the game looked fantastic, Overwatch is a boatload of fun and let me know what your thoughts are on Overwatch down in the comments section below. Counter-Strike's Global Offensive is next up. Here at 4K high settings, you're looking at about 223 FPS on average, but most of the time we're actually kind of capping out at three or 400 frames per second. So whichever way you put it, the game visually looked pretty fantastic and there are no complaints from me. It's an eSports title, it's an older game running on a really, really powerful PC. So these results are hardly surprising. Next up then today, we've got a bit of Battlefield 5. Here you're looking 82 FPS on average with 69 and 43 FPS for the 90th and 99th percentile results. Those numbers may seem a bit low, but that was at 4K medium settings with DLSS enabled. Tone it down to 1440p and you're going to be looking more like 120 FPS on average with 106 and 87 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. So you've certainly got options when it comes to Battlefield 5. Next up is Doom Eternal. Here at 4K Ultra Nightmare with V-Sync off, uh, the game looked unreal. 142 frames per second on average, which for a bit of context uh, is 19 frames per second lower than a Core i9-10900K. So, you know, you are losing a bit of performance, but for the money saved, I'd argue it's worth it, with 130 and 124 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. Next up today is a new entry on the list. You guys have been asking for this a lot, and rightly so. It is Rainbow Six Siege. 4K medium settings, you're looking 253 frames per second using the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. No stuttering, no screen tearing, no lag, and esports level frame rates at 4K. Finally then, the last game today is Fortnite. Here I once again tested at 4K, but with medium settings and RTX disabled. I also enabled DLSS and put it on performance mode, which basically is going to give us a bit of extra frame rate by using AI to upscale the image. That left us with 174 frames per second on average, uh, with a 90 and 99th percentile result of 131 and 119 respectively. This is only around a 20 frames per second drop from that Core i9-10900K, and considering that that build costs another three or four hundred dollars, I think it really goes to show that gaming on a bit of a budget, using a bit of your value price to performance kind of metrics with an RTX 3080 is not to be sniffed at. With that being said though, that pretty much wraps it up for the gaming benchmarks today and the whole video. If you did enjoy it, make sure to give it a big old like rating and get subscribed for more from me. Thank you very much for watching though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.